Okay, before I start, I'm actually going to ask for a volunteer. So if somebody can raise their hand real quick who wants to come up here. Come on, I need a volunteer, guys. Bam, okay. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to uh, hang out with my friend uh, Jeff over here. He's one of my coworkers. And he's going to ask you to basically type something using the Microsoft HoloLens. Something very simple, launching a Windows browser and then typing with it now. Uh, you guys won't see this, but the, the main reason that I want to talk to you about this is because what he's going to be doing is something that's incredibly simple to do, which is typing a website address into a browser. And I just want you to have in your mind how long this is going to take. And then I'm going to show you at the end some of the cool technology that we're developing with brain computer interfaces to solve these kinds of problems that exist. So we'll let them do their thing on the side, and I'll get started. Right now, we're at a point where the Apple II was. Now, the Apple II is this incredible machine that has tons of potential. The main issue is that it's primarily used by people who are hobbyists, who are focused primarily in, in very specialized situations. But what really created a breakthrough is the Apple Lisa. And the reason for this is because what it added was a mouse and a graphical user interface. This is where we're at right now with augmented reality. We have this incredible tool that can go almost anywhere and can really create an amazing technology. But using it is very awkward. And right now, what you're going to see is he's going to mess around with this. And we'll just see how long it takes for him to do something that is so simple to actually do. And this comes down to the problem. Virtual reality controls are limited, they're awkward, and they're preventing people from really taking advantage of this and making this a ubiquitous technology that literally becomes the computing platform of the future. The solution to this is actually taking multimodal approaches and creating an ecosystem of solutions that respect the way our mind works. And why do I say respect the way our mind works? The reason for this is because now we're working in three-dimensional space. This is the way that we naturally examine and interact with the world. And us as human beings want to be able to touch, want to be able to interact in a very natural method. Now, there's a lot of great groups doing this. For example, Meta is working on their technology, and it's based off of some very old ideas. But they call it the hand-brain connection, where you use image processing, and you use the user's hand interactions in natural ways to create something that feels natural to do. And there's always going to be a realm for motion and touch. You know, it feels right to push objects around. iFluence, another uh, startup company that does uh, Eye tracking, they've done it with something called the eye brain connection. And what we do at Neurable is we're closing that loop to bring the ecosystem together into something we call the brain brain connection. Where we're what we're literally doing is looking at how the brain works naturally and then connecting that together toward an augmented reality solution for interaction. So, what is a brain computer interface? Just big picture, I want to cover this. Basically, it's a method that allows you to record brain activity. In our cases, we use something called electroencephalography, which is a fancy way of saying we record your brain activity without using any type of invasive technology. And then we process that using our technology, and that allows you to actually control things such as wheelchairs and computers. Now, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a minor in neuroscience today, just so that you guys learn something as well, too, instead of just seeing cool demos. There's four types of modalities in brain-computer interfaces. The first two is motor sensory imagery, <clears throat> visually evoked potentials. And then after that, we have slow cortical potentials and event-related potentials. So I'm going to quickly touch on each, and, each one of these and tell you some of the downsides that exist with them. And then after that, it'll all come together to show you how we're really changing the game and how we approach these signals. So the first one's called motor imagery. It's a very simple approach. When you imagine a movement with your left arm, you actually get a change in your motor cortex on the right-hand side of your brain for, for your, uh, in your motor cortex area. If you imagine your feet, you actually get something that's more centrally located. And at the end, if you imagine your right hand actually on the left-hand side, uh, you get a change in your brain activity. They've done some really cool things with this. This is a group in Graz. They're friends of ours. Basically, what they've done is they've connected this kind of system together in order to allow people to play World of Warcraft. Now, this is really cool to look at, and you'll see how it works, but it requires training. You actually have to have the person physically trained to make the areas of their brain strong enough to actually create the brain commands that they're going to use. So here you can see how the training process is done with them. Over time, after a few months, basically this person will be able to do it without even having to move their hands. They're just going to imagine these commands, which is really cool to think about. 
The other thing too, and you'll see this on the video coming up, is that it allows you to have an analog-like control where you have strengths in how your response actually happens. So it's going to happen right here. So you can see he's able to move the character forward. He's able to move him to the left and to the right. And then all the other commands in World of Warcraft are actually done through scripts. But once again, as a consumer, it's not really something that's useful to you if you have to spend you know, weeks to months to learn how to master this type of technology. The next system is called a slow cortical potential system. And basically, when you do mathematics or something that's strenuous to your brain activity, you actually get a change in something called your slow cortical. And it's actually a potential change. So when you increase your brain activity, the opposite effect happens in a, in a signal called the slow cortical, and you actually get a raise in brain activity. And when you actually lower your brain activity, you relax yourself, you actually get a decrease in the slow cortical potential. Now, in the research end, these kinds of brain-computer interfaces have become less used. They're, they use them a lot in consumer-based applications. But the reality of it is that they're very difficult to learn. To truly master them, they can take years. And actually, I remember one of my first research papers that I read, it literally took them two years to train a person to reliably do it. And all they had to do was a binary response, yes and no. And because it's fallen out of favor, I, I couldn't actually find a video for you guys. The third system is called steady state visually evoked potentials. Basically, this works by showing a person four images, one, two, three, four, it can be any number, but they all change or, or flicker at a different frequency. And when a person is not paying attention, which you can see here in the brain responses, there's no change in their brain response whatsoever. But as soon as they decide to focus on one, in this case, the number one, you'll see a change in their brain activity at the same frequency as the, as the light changes that they see, which is actually really cool if you guys think about it. That, that tells you that your brain is actually doing something when it sees things changing. And it's a very simple signal to pick up. Here you can see a steady state visually poten uh, evoked potential BCI. It's flashing at a very fast rate. Now, because of these flashes, it actually induces sicknesses in people a lot of the time. It's very fast, but it's also uncomfortable to use over long periods of time. The next one is an event-related potential. Once again, we show you different, different actions. Normally, we do typing, brain typing with this. It's really cool. When a person focuses on the first one, the number one, but an item on the screen changes. It can be a, a pixel change. It can be a color. It can be anything. You basically get no response if it's the, if it's the target they're not trying to select. And then as you move through this, when they finally hit the target they're trying to select, which is the number one, you get something called an event-related potential, or a P300. It's a positive change 300 milliseconds after the event that they wanted to select. And lastly, once again, if it's a different target, nothing happens. So here you can see somebody using a P300 brain-computer interface, and they're trying to type the letter V. And I just want you to see how slow this is. You can see that every single time the letter V flashes, we record a small part of their brain activity, but then we have to take these large averages together to actually get a usable result. And so right here, you might be thinking, Ramsey is like, you're showing me all these downsides to these BCIs, and you know, how are they ever going to be incorporated to an AR world? This doesn't feel natural. This doesn't feel right. That's really the challenges that we're, we're taking care of here at Nurable, that we're really overcoming. We're taking these types of modalities together, and we're looking at them and analyzing them in a completely different way. And because of that, we've created a significant breakthrough that was actually done through my PhD program. And we're spinning it out as a startup company. Well, I guess we already spun it out. But basically, what we've been able to do is take some of these modalities and break through some of their limitations. I'm going to show you guys two demos here real quick. Before I get to that, uh, well, I'll get to you in just a second. So two demos. One of our older technology, when we used it with uh, hardware systems. And then afterwards, I'm going to show you guys something that actually no one else has seen outside of our laboratory, which is our technology actually running in a virtual reality space for an augmented reality style demo that we did. So this is uh, some of our brain tech right here. And you can see she's very crisply able to move this technology forward, very easily able to turn the technology and even wave the little hands on it. So these high dimensionalities of control is really what sets our technology apart. Uh, if there's any brain-computer interface scientists here, you'll notice that you know, it's not that impressive to push a, a wheelchair forward, but to have complex movements in real time without being affected significantly by noise. And this is for the Discovery Channel, actually. We act a car in 24 hours. It was, that was one experience right there. But really, that level of precision is what we're able to bring to the table. 
So next, I'm going to show you a demo of us interacting with the YouTube system. It happens very subtly. This is how we want to bring it to you guys in the future through uh, augmented reality. Uh, but I want to tell you that preface it just because it's very subtle and you may, you may miss it. But before I get to that, I want to ask, how long did it take you to type that website address? Too long. Too long. <laughs> Jeff? Uh, two minutes and 30 seconds. Two minutes and 30 seconds to type, what was it, Neurable.com, his favorite website, right? Yep. So here you can see our technology works directly with any game engine, uh, Unity, for example. Very rough demo here. This is one of our earliest builds. But basically what you can do is as soon as our technology detects that you want to make a selection, you're able to quickly bring up a menu. And then we're able to quickly jump into the web, interact with YouTube, launch a video. And what I think is really cool about this is let's say you want to leave a comment. It took him two minutes to type neurable.com. But I want to show you how, it's, how it would work with our technology. It's very simple. Launch the website address, and very easily we're able to help you type with your brain activity in a very natural way. And so somebody was talking about how would this tech be used to communicate, you know, ghost in the shell style, right, with your brain activity. We can do that right now. And this is the kind of technology that we're going to be bringing forward uh, as part of Neurable. So with that, I'd like to thank you guys so much for your time, and I'd love to take any questions.